The mission of the Occupational Health Clinic is the prevention of all workplace injuries, illnesses and disabilities and to promote the highest degree of physical, mental and social well-being of all workers. We also want to identify workplace factors which affect the health and well-being of all workers. So, here's that little mosquito. <coughs> the Culex pipian is the most popular mosquito that carries the West Nile virus. <coughs> Pardon me. So what is West Nile virus? Most folks in this room have heard about it and you may be aware of the cycle that it takes for a human to become infected. So let's just review that. A mosquito carrying West Nile virus in its blood bites a bird. That bird then becomes a carrier of West Nile virus. Another mosquito buzzes along and bites that bird. So this is a mosquito that doesn't have West Nile virus. It bites that bird and subsequently gets the virus. That mosquito then buzzes around and then if it finds its way on someone else, some human's body, and bites that human, then that human will become infected with West Nile virus. But let's keep it in perspective. Less than 1% of mosquitoes actually become infected with West Nile virus. And there's about 80 species of mosquitoes in Canada, and only 10 are carriers. There are 50 uh, species of mosquitoes in Ontario, and only 8 of those mosquito types carry West Nile virus. The organism, the microorganism that West Nile virus belongs to is the family of viruses called Flavoridae. And yes, I had to practice that. Uh, human and horses can become infected by a mosquito that is carrying West Nile virus. What do you think about cats and dogs? They don't seem to become as affected, and we, we don't know why yet, but they don't seem to be as affected as horses and humans do by the virus. So where in the world did West Nile virus come from? Well, we know that it originated in around 1937, and that it came from the West Nile region in Uganda. It's more common in Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. And, and New York City has really been hit by its uh, situations um, with the <coughs> World Trade Center and uh, some of the situations that they've been under politically. And then they were also the first ones to have West Nile virus detected in 1999. We do know that 150 birds carry West Nile virus. And for some, it can be their end. West Nile virus was first confirmed in a bird case in Windsor, Essex in August of 2001. So as far as we know, no humans had it that year. It wasn't until 2002 in Ontario and Quebec that we had the first cases of humans who had West Nile virus. But let's keep it in perspective again. Did you know that on an average, 1,900 people per year die from the flu in Canada? 1,900, that's a lot of people. And they say that more die in car accidents as well. So let's look at the statistics for last year, 2003. <coughs> in all of Canada, probable cases of West Nile virus reported was 115. Let's compare that with 2002, it was 86. The number of confirmed cases of West Nile virus in Canada in 2003 was 1,220 people and 340 people in 2002. The number of deaths we had in Canada was 10 last year. In all of Canada, it was 10, <coughs> compared to 1,900 who died of the flu, and 20 in 2002. What I want to let you know about these figures is some of, these, some of the folks that are listed in the statistics for Health Canada are people who have, were already sick. They also found that they had West Nile virus, so they aren't, don't know if they died from West Nile virus, or West Nile virus contributed to them dying of whatever disease they had. Also included in these statistics are people who have traveled and came back to Canada and had West Nile virus but had traveled. <coughs> so we aren't certain if they contracted West Nile virus while they were away or not. So I want to be clear about that. However, those numbers in these figures are quite small. Well, if we look at the statistics by province, we look at Ontario here in the middle. <coughs> the number of confirmed cases in Ontario last year was 89. It was 319 in 2002, so last year we were better off with West Nile virus as a province. We only had two deaths in Ontario last year as compared with 18 in 2002. Let's look at the rest of the provinces. Saskatchewan, oh, 792 confirmed cases of West Nile virus, <coughs> six deaths. <coughs> the provinces who seemed to fare the best were Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the Yukon Territory. 
<coughs> pardon me, Newfoundland had absolutely no cases of West Nile virus last year. <coughs> How about the United States? How did they do last year? <coughs> I didn't want to put every single state up here, but what I wanted to do was to highlight the states that were closest to us, the folks who had the lowest numbers, and look at Colorado. 2,947 reported human cases of West Nile virus in Colorado. 61 deaths. Michigan, our closest neighbors, had 19 reported cases last year. However, in 2002, there were 614. They had two deaths last year. In 2002, 51 deaths. And you can see for Illinois and also for Ohio. So that's from the Center of Disease Control, CDC from the US. So if you do get bitten, so remember, less than 1% of mosquitoes carry West Nile virus. But if you did get bitten by a mosquito that was carrying West Nile virus, how does that impact you as a person? Well, first of all, 79% chance you're not going to get anything at all. You're just going to be a carrier. The short form for that is now changed with Health Canada to WNAI, and I'll show you that on the next slide. A 20% chance that you will get the symptoms of West Nile fever, which I'll explain, and a less than 1% chance that you will get the symptoms of West Nile virus. So keep that in mind. Less than 1% <coughs> chance that you're going to get bitten by an infected mosquito with West Nile virus, and then a less than 1% chance that you'll get infected with the West Nile virus neurological syndrome. So WNNS now stands for West Nile virus neurological syndromes. That's the one where you get, can get possibly encephalitis or meningitis. West Nile fever, WNF. And WNAI is West Nile virus asymptomatic infection. Asymptomatic, asymptomatic meaning no symptoms. So you would just be a carrier. So the symptoms of the West Nile virus fever are flu-like, fever, body ache. Some people will get rashes, and some people can even get swollen glands. They feel not too well, under the weather completely. Nice little picture that Barry picked there. We've all been there once or twice. <coughs> symptoms of West Nile virus neurological syndromes. Well, there's meningitis and encephalitis, both medical emergencies. So if you started to have a severe headache, high fever, stiff neck, muscle aches, vomiting, disorientation, feeling paralysis in your limbs. You have to get yourself to emergency or if it's happening to someone that you love, you need to get them into emergency right away. Because the person could go into a coma and they could experience death from that. So encephalitis is inf inflammation of the actual brain itself and meningitis is the inflammation of the lining of the brain or the inflammation of the spinal <coughs> cord. So. You get, you're on the golf course, you're golfing, you get bit by about, say, five mosquitoes. And you think, oh, do I have West Nile virus? I haven't developed the flu tonight. Well, no. It takes about two to 15 days before the flu symptoms actually show up in your body. So that's what you need to pay attention for, is that two to 15 days after you've been bitten to see if you have any symptoms. Who's at risk? What do you think? For those who have a weak immune system, perhaps a chronic disease like cancer, diabetes, heart problems. Those kind of people are set up because their systems are not functioning at 100%. The elderly, folks that are 70 years of age or older, their immune systems aren't functioning as optimally as a 20-year-old person. I have read some reports that say people over 40 are more prone. So those of us who are over 40 need to try to keep our immune system strong and set ourselves up to be healthy so that we have a lesser chance of our immune systems being compromised and succumbing to the virus. And those people working outside, <coughs> and we'll get into those people working outside in a few moments. So how do people get West Nile virus? Is it just by being bitten by a mosquito? Well, that's a possibility, absolutely. Research has also shown that you could possibly get it from a blood transfusion. Fortunately, the Canadian blood supply is now being tested for West Nile virus since July of last year. It can also occur through an organ transplant. Research shows that it could happen to a mother who's feeding a child in her uterus. There is a possibility that it could be passed that way, but we don't have enough research to show that it, it's an absolute thing. Also, there is a case where a mother was breastfeeding a child and the child 
and became ill and the mother was tested and did have West Nile virus. But again, there's not enough research to say that it's an absolute yet. And there were some lab technicians, I believe it was last year or the year before, that contracted West Nile virus when they were working with blood samples from people who had had um, their blood drawn that suspect they had West Nile virus. So workers who spend time outdoors are more at risk because they spend more time outdoors. So what are the riskier times of day to catch West Nile virus if you were going to have a concern about what time of the day should I be out? Does anybody have an idea? 10 and 3. 10 and 3. That's a really, that's a really um, good time to have in your mind because that's actually about sun exposure yeah. when the sun's it's at later its in the hottest. When the sun's setting. Right. It's when the sun is setting or when the sun is rising in the morning. Because do you know, ever notice when you get up, if you go camping or something and the mosquitoes are out, the sun's kind of just coming up and it's misty. And then in the, in the evening, just as the sun is setting, the mosquitoes seem to be more active. So although they say to, that it's important to be preventative the whole day through, those are the two times that we are, have to be more vigilant about taking care of ourselves. When people are out in the community and they're working and they're breathing and they're breathing heavily, they're expelling carbon dioxide into the air, which has been said to be something that mosquitoes are attracted to. So that's another thing to keep in mind about workers outside. So what kind of workers spend more time outdoors? Well, we have construction workers, police officers, city workers, hydro workers, the cable guy, postal workers. So what would happen if you're bitten on the job? Hmm. This was a question last year that a lot of us had. But now the WSIB has um, developed some terrific guidelines around that. And I would like to um, encourage you to look in your package on the right side. You'll see a yellow page like this. And what this says is, due to the increased interest in West Nile virus, and this is from the WSIB, the Worker Safety Insurance Board, we have received many inquiries about coverage, benefits, and services mm -hmm. under the WSI Worker Safety and Insurance Act. So, workers who are infected with West Nile virus in the course of their employment will be entitled to the usual benefits and services available under the Act. Mm -hmm. As in all disease claims, their entitlement is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. <coughs> And the provisions of the Act say <coughs> it provides compensation for, per for personal injury by accident arising out of and in the course of employment. Okay, so that's here. <coughs> and I hope you all got a copy of that. Behind that yellow paper, you'll also find in your books, your packages, the WSIB information. And I'd like to thank WSIB for all of their help with the presentation. There's four sets of information there. One is about workers and one is about employers. <coughs> these are exposure forms. Now these exposure forms can be used by a worker and or by an employer. So if someone is bitten by some mosquitoes and they're concerned that they might have had an exposure to West Nile virus, an individual worker can fill out that form and send it into WSIB and that alerts WSIB to the possibility that this person, this worker, has, has a possible exposure to West Nile virus and WSIB has been aware that there is a possibility. Also, there's a form for an employer that an employer can fill out if there's a group of workers or an individual worker that has possibly been exposed to West Nile virus and you'll see on the exposure form that there are about four places for workers' names to go in and you are invited to add another page if you need to. So. But an employer does not have to send that in exclusively for a worker to be recognized. A worker can send a form in even if the employer does not. Now, what if the employee develops symptoms? Let's say you start getting the flu and you're not feeling good. Then there is a possibility that you've developed the West Nile virus. So you would need to seek medical attention. You would need to have your blood drawn to get it examined for West Nile virus. <coughs> then you would also have to advise your employer so that they know that there's a possibility that you have contracted it on the job. And the second thing is to complete a Form 7. The claim that you would have as a worker is only activated when the symptoms are present. So by sending an exposure form into WSIB, that does not constitute a claim for those of you who know this language, okay? 
So how would a person find out if they have West Nile virus? As I mentioned earlier, you need a blood test from your doctor. The testing that we're using now is called ELISA testing. And uh, how long do you think it takes for the results to be back? It's three days now. The testing is the blood work is now no longer being sent to Winnipeg. It's being done in Ontario. So the turn turnaround time for getting the results back is much faster. We're also doing confirmatory testing. So in an area where West Nile virus has been active. They are drawing members of a community, for instance, in Halton, where they are taking blood samples from people to find out exactly how many people in that area are carriers with no symptoms, how many have fever, how many have contracted meningitis encephalitis. Did anyone file a WSI claim? A WSIB claim? Well, yes, they did. There was an individual in 2002 <coughs> in the construction industry in Ontario who had a claim accepted for being exposed while at work and contracting West Nile virus. And thank you to WSIB for that information. <coughs> Can West Nile virus be treated? Not yet. They are working on a vaccine that's supposed to be piloted this <coughs> summer in the US. There is a vaccine available for horses, but there isn't anything available for humans yet. What physicians will do if someone does come down with the symptoms of West Nile virus is they will try to treat it the best they can. So just to review the West Nile virus transmission cycle, an infected mosquito bites a bird. The bird then becomes an infected. And then an uninfected mosquito will bite the bird and get the infection of the West Nile virus from that bird. And then that mosquito will tra can possibly travel on to bite a human. And keep in mind, too, that mosquitoes, from what I have read, are not all that fond of humans. They prefer birds. So they, so they um, Keep that in mind that they're not, uh, you know, trying, they're waiting <coughs> on your eaves trough waiting to dive bomb you. They're actually more interested in birds than they are in humans. Um, and that's all it is for me. I'm going to pass it on to Barry. And um, I'd like to point out to you also that there's a lovely document put out by the Ministry of Labor that you all have in your packages, which are worker, uh, possible worker question and answers about uh, your workplace. and things that workers might want to ask common questions. I do, eh? West Nile virus is not contracted person to person by touching or kissing. It's not <coughs> contracted from animals to humans, so from horses to humans. West Nile virus in North America is more virulent than its counterpart was in Europe and Africa. And um, I don't believe that a dead bird has been found in Ontario yet. Sorry about that. I meant for that line to be out. We do know that West Nile virus is spreading. <coughs> and um, <coughs> we also don't know. Um, we also have a better way of testing the blood samples. So as far as we know, uh, the results that we have are accurate uh, at this time. I'm sorry, this was a slide from last year, and I didn't take it out. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll now pass it over to Barry. I thought that was your side. No, it'll be yours. <laughs> <laughs> Mine starts with prevention. Um, what I'm hoping you guys will walk away from this next portion is that you realize there's a systematic approach in reducing your exposures, not just to zoonotic diseases such as mosquitoes, but to chemical or biological agents. So it's a tiered process. First starts off by identifying the source knowing what the risks are, and thankfully Faye has gone through that, uh, what the risks are. Uh, you want to follow by eliminating the source, okay? So that would be removing standing water. Uh, you can also provide substitution. Uh, this is the general backbone of how you would approach uh, uh, reducing a worker's exposure. Um, you can also try substituting the exposure, but in this case with mosquitoes, you're not going to substitute a bee sting for a mosquito sting. So that is not practical. Um, last, uh, the third one is <coughs> providing engineering controls or administrative controls. And what I mean by that is providing some sort of physical change to the work environment or a work process or practice that will reduce the worker's exposure. So it can be providing screen doors or bug screens or uh, closing the doors altogether. And last but not least is the personal protection. Uh, and for West Nile virus, it would be insect repellents and some sort some practical guidelines that we can follow. I'll look into each in a little more detail now. Identifying the source. 
pretty much what we wanted to do. The red flags were, um, wow, bright light. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, find where uh, uh, the natural habitat of the mosquito. And so any body of water uh, that can sit for more than four days is a potential breeding source, okay? Theoretically, as much as a cap full of water is sufficient, surprisingly, for, for one larvae to hatch. Uh, if your workplace or your home has open windows or damaged bug screens or doors without bug screens, uh, again, that would be a, a point source of any exposure. And of course, any workers or people who spend time outdoors are going to be at risk. It's a little hard to read the fine print here, but I'll walk you through them. Around the house and possibly around the, uh, the factory or, or where you're living or where you're working, you want to look at where or what objects can collect water. Here you have at the top right corner is uh, tarps or garbage bags that will collect water. You can have plants or uh, pot saucers that uh, will accumulate water from overwatering or from rain. Uh, outside you may find children's toys such as a, uh, a wagon, old tires. In the front yard you may have a bird basin or a bird bath. Uh, you may have clogged rain gutters that will need attending to. That's another good source for water to accumulate. And of course if you have a swimming pool in the backyard is you want to cover it. Um, another uh, body, uh, source of body of water would be uh, um, ponds, uh, fish ponds that people have. Around the workplace, similar ideas. You want to look for old tires, garbage bags, uh, tires, tire ruts, or ditches on the property that can accumulate water. Usually you're looking at places that are dark and shady, that, uh, where the sun doesn't get to a lot. Um, uh, the flat rooftops is another uh, uh, dangerous place to, uh, where water can pond. These would be uh, factories, schools. They tend to have flat rooftops. So you would have to uh, monitor how much water is accumulating and address that. And I'll show you how and what you can do. Some factories will use tarpaulins to actually prevent water leaking into a factory because of the cracks and the holes on their ceiling. And these tarpaulins will sometimes create a depression or sink in from the weight of the water, and that itself can be a potential source for mosquitoes to breed. Once you have identified the source, you want to be able to eliminate them. How do we do that? The obvious solution is to remove any standing water. Sounds easy, but not. <laughs> sounds hard, but it's really quite easy. Um, you want, you want to uh, drain or dump water that collects in containers. For example, if you have tires, you can drill holes at the bottom so the water doesn't accumulate. Filling in depressions or ruts with sand or gravel. Uh, remove any debris that's uh, sitting up against the building. Um, seal off empty barrels or containers. And this last one is, is a very practical uh, uh, method for eliminating uh, um, uh, mosquitoes from laying their eggs in a, any body of water or water source. What's required for a larvae to hatch is of course the water and the air-water interface, so the larvae does need oxygen. So if you eliminate that interface by either blocking off using vegetable oil or providing some sort of foam, you break off that seal and the larvae will start, uh, suffocate. And that's the one way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, killing uh, or reducing the mosquito population around your property. Um, or another alternative is to provide uh, or use uh, detergent soaps. Uh, if you're on a rooftop, you can add detergent to, to, the, to the water. Okay, once you have uh, once you've exhausted your, uh, uh, your elimination processes, you want to be able to control by providing some sort of change to the uh, physical environment by providing mosquito netting, closing off bay doors, which may not be practical all the time because during the warm seasons, factories do get quite warm. So it's not the best idea to close off the doors. You'll lose uh, air circulation. So you, you might want to look into providing mosquito nettings, um, provide bug screens. The last two have been put in here only because it is quite common. It's, it's out there uh, at Home Depot. You can buy these units for about $50 and up. They're not as practical. They don't work as well as they should. The difference between insect zappers and traps is the method of, uh, of attracting mosquitoes, for, exa for example. This is what an uh, insect trap would look like. It operates on a propane tank that emits a plume of CO2 which attracts mosquitoes and the mosquitoes fly into the trap and get killed. 
Okay, so there are some problems. It's not 100% uh, proof. Recent studies do show that these uh, uh, equipments or instruments are not uh, selective enough for mosquitoes. They will kill other insects, uh, especially the uh, fluorescent lighting bug zappers. You know, mosquitoes are not attracted to fluorescent light. So that is not uh, an effective uh, approach to controlling exposures. Um, remember that some of them operate in a propane tank. Don't use them indoors because, or near doorways because you're going to be um, um, compromising the, uh, the um, air environment of uh, the workplace by uh, releasing levels of CO, high levels of CO2. So I don't recommend to use those indoors or outdoors. And also, when you have the bug zappers, um, when you're setting a nice electric shock through a bug, you do get nice bug bits flying around within at least six feet radius. And you, so try not to have it anywhere near eating sources. You don't see it, but it's there. Pretty. Last line of defense, personal protection. Here are some various pictures that will show you some alternatives. Um, but essentially, you do want to avoid any outdoor activity. This will be difficult for workers um, that have to work in, uh, during, uh, during the morning, such as parks and recreation, as well as the postal workers. Uh, but this is really for the public, general public. Avoid work during the evenings and mornings when mosquitoes are most active. If it's unavoidable, then um, wear long sleeve clothing, pants, heavier uh, fabrication, trousers, uh, wear socks. A lot of people don't wear socks. <laughs> that will protect your little ankles. Um, gloves, anywhere where you don't have any clothing coverage, you have skin exposures, you want to use insect repellents. So I'll address uh, that now. There are so many different types out there. It's quite overwhelming when we walk down shoppers or any other uh, um, home hardware store that offers insect repellents. These are some examples. Muscal, Buzz Away, Deep Woods Off, Blocker Insect Repellent. This is a new product that is out. Uh, you may see it on the shelf this year or you may mm -hmm. not. It works with soybean oil as opposed to the most common DEET containing products and Naturopel which contains citronella. I'm going to address uh, DEET containing products a little more extensively because that is what's on the market. Okay, I'm going to provide some guidelines here. Uh, they'll contain very, con uh, most of the products will contain varying, varying concentrations of DEET. They'll come in various forms from lotions, aerosol cans, oils, and even spray pumps. The method of application, of course, different. It's been found that the aerosol cans actually work better than lotions. People tend to overload with lotions. Um, so uh, you may want to consider lo looking at the spray pumps or the spray cans. Uh, citronella containing products are not uh, as effective as DEET. It is undergoing re-evaluation by the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. They are, a, I believe, an adjunct of Health Canada. So with all the different products out there and different variations, different forms, what's the best way or how do we choose one? <laughs> Remember, insecticides are not repellents. I've seen many people spray insecticides on themselves. It's just, what are you thinking? <laughs> not the same thing. Make sure it's the insect repellent. Choose repellents that are registered here in Canada. If you go across, if you go, if you go down south, you will find a, a huge selection of various products that do not undergo the same sort of uh, 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 extensive battery of, of tests that we would here in Canada. Uh, so make sure that it's uh, been registered here in Canada. Uh, choose uh, products that have an active ingredient of a lower <coughs> concentration, especially if you're spending less time outdoors, okay? If you're going to spend more time outdoors, then you may want to reconsider looking at something that has a higher uh, concentration. But always, always follow the instruction, read the label, Apply sparingly on any skin that is exposed. Don't apply it on any, uh, like underneath clothing, like your buttocks. Don't put it there. Um, do not apply to open wounds or scars, OK? Uh, repeat application only if necessary. If you're doing work outside that requires a lot of heavy manual labor, you're perspiring a lot, then you may want to follow the instruction, read the label, make sure that you're applying when needed. You may need to apply a second coat. Uh, when you're done, wash any uh, treated skin with lukewarm water and soap just to remove any of the, uh, uh, the insecticides, or uh, sorry, repellent. Uh, remember that higher concentrations do not make it more effective. I remember a couple years back in was it, 99, there was 
95% de available. It just ate the wristband. <laughs> My plastic wristband was gone. So the PM, uh, PMRA, since I believe 2002, has been phasing out products that contain higher levels of DEET. So now on the shelves, you will come across nothing higher than 30%, unless you go to old stores in Timbuktu, they may have some old stock left over. 30% DEET will offer about six hours of protection. 15 would give about five. 10% <coughs> roughly three, and two hours for 5% DEET. Non-DEET non alternatives, this would apply to people who live in the rural area or have farms. They tend to rely on natural predators if they want to look at a more uh, kosher way of uh, protecting themselves or reducing mosquito population. Uh, they could use bats, purple martins, fish and frogs. The important thing to remember with natural predators is that they're not selective for uh, controlling mosquito population. The last thing you want to be doing is introducing a uh, foreign predator to a, a ecosystem. So always contact your natural, the Ministry of Natural Resources for more information on what you can use. Um, there are products out there, uh, electronic devices that mimic the, uh, the wing beats of a dragonfly. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Lacking a lot of information on how effective that works, okay? Sounds good in theory, but really limited. Uh, information on, on how, how effective it is. Other alternatives are essential oils. Um, that is, you know, a lot of uh, what we, a lot of people are now turning to are uh, like alternative essential oils because people think it's safer, it's non chemical agent. You have to remember that it's not as effective, and because it's a natural chemical or natural element, it can become a sensitizer as well. So do follow up. If you go to the agency, they will have evaluations of all the products out there. Um, they will discuss uh, sense, uh, sensitization, toxicity, uh, a whole bunch of it. Uh, whose responsibility is it? It's really everyone's responsibility, not just the employers who recognize the exposures, but also the, work, the workers to be able to, to understand what their risks are and how they can protect themselves. Uh, always approach your health and safety and your supervisors if you have a concern. And as of yet, I don't believe the Windsor-Essex Health County or County Health Unit, sorry, uh, has uh, uh, um, posted their standing water bylaw hotline or uh, reporting dead bird hotline. It's probably not until next month when they'll have that posted on their website. So what has the city done in the past and what can they do? The, the control of mosquitoes is really based on a, a thorough evaluation, very extensive, based on what has happened historically. Um, the types of products used and chosen, how it's applied, will really be dictated by the season, the proximity <coughs> to the residential area, how close it is to people, number of adult mosquitoes in the area, and of course, what is the risk of the uh, mosquito-borne disease. <coughs> two ways of controlling the mosquito population is by applying larvicides or adulticides. The, two different, the difference between the two is that larvicides, you are introducing a chemical agent or some sort of bi biological agent that will kill the larva before it matures. And uh, obviously the adulticide is the reverse, that it will affect the adults, okay? So with larviciding in the past, here in the Windsor-Essex area, we have used methoprene and Bacillus thuringiensis BTI. Don't confuse this with the Bacillus anthrax species. Not all Bacillus species are hazardous. This is actually very safe. Um, some adulticides that you will come across is malathion and pyrethins that will be used by licensed and trained people and usually for rural and farm areas by spraying or fogging. To talk about BTI and lar larviciding <laughs> and methoprene, they're both biodegradable. They don't uh, persist long in the environment. Uh, these can be applied uh, if the pond or dugout is wholly contained on the property. Uh, it's not required that you have a license to use a product, okay? Um, the, it, it, it's a, uh, the application of BTI is a pellet form, so it's not being sprayed, so there's very minimal inhalation exposure. Um, it's, it's applied directly to the water source. Uh, as I had mentioned, the uh, insecticide or the insecticidal agent biodegrades within two or three days. This is the alternative. Uh, currently, uh, it is the only registered product uh, that is registered as larvicide in Canada. It does require a license. Uh, it acts as a growth inhibitor for the, uh, for the larva, for larvae. 
Uh, it, can, it has a minimal impact on freshwater vertebrates or invertebrates, but again, like I said, it does not last long. It does about a gray with UV light and with some microorganisms. So where can we go for more information? Here's a list of numbers that you can contact if you're in the Ontario area or the Windsor-Essex area. First people to look at is the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. Their phone number and website has been posted. Last year, as I mentioned, they did have reporting dead bird hotlines or uh, reporting standing water. Uh, they'll probably reissue the same numbers, but it's not confirmed yet. Uh, give them another month. They're reevaluating what the risks were from last year, and they're trying to decide what, uh, what kind of plan or action they should do uh, or take for 2004. Health Canada has a plethora of information on their website with respect to insecticides, repellents, larva sightings, adult sightings, sun blockings, lots of factories available. <laughs> Check out their website. Um, the Ontario Ministry of Labour, Faye has talked about and addressed the issue of filing WSIB claims, uh, what you can do. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, if you live on a uh, rural or a farming area, you can contact them on what you can do, what sort of protections you can take. Uh, if you're thinking of, uh, of introducing natural predators, do talk to the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources first, you can call them. And of course, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency has been listed here as well. So just remember, there's been a lot of information we've talked about today, but remember that any workers spending time outdoors but not restricted to them, even factory workers are at risk, and people who spend all time gardening are at risk. But the risk is extremely low, as, as Faye has discussed. And remember that when you take the steps to preventing the injury or illnesses, that there is a tiered process. You want to identify the risk, eliminate, control, uh, repel, and report the incidences. And of course, you have your local contacts. Done.